When we were serving in the country of Peru, one of the experiences that we had is that we got to be uh, translators for medical campaigns a couple of times that came down. And I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but sometimes people, doctors, nurses from North America, from United States and Canada say, we'll go to a country like Peru and we'll kind of put on this micro clinic and folks who have some kind of a medical issue can show up and ask to be seen by the doctor and they try to treat them for what they have. And so we translated a couple of times for those doctors and nurses. And on, one of the things that we kind of learned out of this experience is that you look at people and you just don't know what's going on in their lives on the out, you know, when you see them on the outside. And we'd see folks that seemed like they were perfectly fine, like there was nothing wrong with them, but then they'd come and talk to the doctor and you'd find out that they had uh, physical pains, a back pain or a foot pain or a stomach pain. And you'd talk to them and find out they had emotional pain or spiritual pain. And in these conversations, you realize that so many people are carrying brokenness around with them, woundedness around with them that is not apparent when you look at them and, and see them at first glance. And so we, we, we kind of realize that in these campaigns, and, and it's really affected the way we, we, we live our lives. And I've, as, in this last year, as we've gotten to know you and the community of Mound Ridge, we know that those stories are out there, you know, that there is woundedness, that there is brokenness. And if it's not in your life, then sometimes it's in the life of your friend or the life of your kids or your grandkids, that there, there are things that happen to us that come our way in life. And when I read the New Testament, and when I read Paul, I am struck by his insistence on how we are to meet people and love people, that we meet people where they're at, and that we love them into the kingdom. And you really see this here crystallized in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, that passage that Matteo just read for us. We meet people where they're at, and we love them into the kingdom. Now, Paul is writing to the church in Thessalonica. It's this congregation, and I'll try to flip a map up there for you in a second, but it's this congregation that's on the, the coast, the east coast of Macedonia, part of Greece. Um, it, w- it was a city that had a large Jewish population, and in the book of Acts, where you see Paul showing up in, in Thessalonica, in Acts chapter 17, uh, Paul goes to the synagogue. And he is teaching there about Jesus as the Messiah. And some of the Jewish folks that are there accept that message, as do some God-fearers. And God-fearers are people who are at the edge of the synagogue, and they, were, they admired the, the Jewish way of life. They admired the Jewish scriptures, our Old Testament, and, and the, the temple worship and the history of the Jewish people. But because of, of circumcision or, or because of the food laws, they, or because they simply weren't born Jewish, they felt that they could not become full participants in the worship life of the synagogue, and so they were kind of on the edge. And in Acts 17, we see that when Paul shows up in Thessalonica and teaches the gospel there, that he has a lot of these god fears respond to his word. And so much so that in the, 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 some of the Jewish leaders in Thessalonica become upset with him, and they kind of run Paul out of town. So what he does is go with his companions down the, down the coast to the city of Berea. Um, Luke, who is the author of Acts of the Apostles, kind of puts it bluntly in Acts 17, 11, where he says, the, the people of Berea were of a more noble character than the people of Thessalonica. Um, and they received Paul well in Berea, but even there, um, some folks from Thessalonica show up behind him and, and kind of drive him out of Thessalonica. So he goes down to Athens, and it's in Athens that you see Paul going to Mars Hill and preaching there to the philosophers who congregate in Athens um, in Acts chapter 17. But this church in Thessalonica is a congregation that, that Paul holds dear to his heart. He founded the church on his second missionary journey. It was founded in persecution, his own, and then he's worried for the church there that they might be suffering persecution. But they love him. He loves them. They always had a, a great relationship. And, and so he, he writes back to them, and many people regard 1 Thessalonians as Paul's very first letter. He writes back to them to kind of check in and see how they're doing. And, and we see Paul just, just gushing with love for them. At the beginning of 1 Thessalonians, there in, cha- in chapter 1, verse 2, he says, every time I think of you, I thank God for you in all of my prayers. And um, later in chapter 3, he says, how can I thank God enough for you? Um, so he has this just deep love for the, for the church in Thessalonica. 
Um, and, and, you know, maybe it's almost like this, this love letter that, that he writes to them, and I don't know if we're going to get a chance to, to see um, where Thessalonica was, maybe. Um, but Paul writes this, this dear letter to them. There it is. There's Thessalonica. See my green arrow? Um, he, he goes down the coast after they chase him out of Thessalonica. But he, he loves this church, and he writes back to them, and it's kind of this uh, church that had a, a great experience with them. Here's, here's from the, the church that's in Thessalonica currently, a Greek Orthodox church, and you see Paul standing there on, on our right, and you see St. Demetrios, who was a saint that came out of Thess- Thessalonica, and they're holding the church between them, which I just love. I, I, uh, that, Paul holds this church in his heart, in his prayers. He loves this church. He holds up this church. Um, and he writes this letter of love to them. I mean, it's kind of appropriate for Valentine's Day. And um, he loves the Thessalonians. And, and so you see, him, you see him just gushing with love for these folks. He came to them and he says in, in chapter 1, verse 5, he said, I preached the word for you, the gospel for you, not just with words, but I preach the gospel to you also with deep conviction, with, with the Holy Spirit power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. And Paul's really showing him his way of life. He's saying, look at me. This is my deep conviction. Don't just hear my words. It's not just with words. Watch how I live. Um, he sets an example for them, and he shows them how they're to care for one another. And, and the way Paul really writes, writes uh, 1 Thessalonians, the, the first three chapters are kind of a, a summary of his relationship with them and the care that they have for each other. Um, and then chapter four and following, he talks about how to live a holy life. He meets them where they're at, and then he encourages them on. And you see Paul take this way of writing in some of his other letters. He does the same thing in Romans, right? He doesn't know the Roman church, but he writes to them and talks about who he is in, verses one, in chapters 1 through 11. And then in chapters 12 through 16, Paul talks about, so therefore, and, and teaches them what it means to be a follower of Jesus. He does the same thing in Ephesians, chapters 1 through 3, then, verse, then chapter 4. Since therefore you have been called, live a life worthy of your calling. And he teaches what is the content of that life. What does that life look like? So Paul is doing that there. He's meeting these people where they're at, and then he's just loving them into the kingdom. And it's really this, this powerful moment that, that Paul has where, where he's connecting with the church and, and calling them to care for each other. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I am struck by how important it is to meet people where they are at, to just connect with people in whatever situation that they're in and, and care for them. And one of the things that I've loved about being a part of this congregation is how you care for one another and seeing the ways that you, you hold together th- through thick and thin. Because you know what? It's really easy to, to focus on doctrine and to make sure we take the proper stance on things. And, and you know, I can get up here and I can preach the gospel and, and, and have the right doctrine and, and, and preach the word with the power and conviction that Paul talks about. But if I do not have love, then I am just some kind of a clanging gong and a clashing cymbal, and the same goes for the whole church. And I think sometimes kind of as the church, um, as the church across all nations, that I think sometimes we have forgotten this, that if whatever we're doing, whether we are preaching the the gospel or or trying to live the word through our our examples, if we do not have love, then it, it won't matter. It won't count for anything. And you know, you got to have the doctrine right too. And I promise you that I will always get the doctrine right. But, but we got to have love to inform that. And I'm much more concerned that we have too, uh, not enough love and, and too much focus sometimes on, on getting it all right. But we've got to meet people where they're at with all the woundedness in their lives and just be with them and kind of ask ourselves that question, can we weep with those who weep? Um, can we be in places of brokenness with those who are broken? And I think the place we've got to start is in the church. This is why Paul in 1 Corinthians talks about the body of Christ as this place where when one rejoices, all rejoice together. When one uh, weeps, all weep together. I think we've got to start this in the body of Christ, but we've got to, to learn to be with people where they're at. And you know, I'm really attracted to, to the story of King David, this wonderful story of the Old Testament, a man who, that the scriptures say, had a heart that was after God's own heart. 
And, and what that means in the scriptures is not that David always did everything exactly like God would have done it or in accordance with God's desires. We know David messed up, right? We know that, that David did not always get it right, and, and uh, God did not allow him to do some things like build the temple. Uh, but what it means to say that David had a heart after God's own heart is that David's heart was broken for the things that broke the heart of God, and that David rejoiced for the things that made God's heart rejoice. And I think of, of Absalom, David's son. Do you remember this story? Um, Absalom, this, this young man who is strong and handsome and charismatic and so full of promise, but he wants the kingdom now. And he, he, he incites a rebellion against his father, David. And it just goes to show of how, what, how, what kind of a powerful and attractive figure Absalom was because uh, many of the Israelites do come to his cause to rebel against King David in his old age. He incites this rebellion, and Absalom, in the course of the battle, um, as he's fleeing from the battle, he's riding on a, on a mule, and he rides under an oak tree, and he has this luxurious, long, black hair um, like something off the cover of one of those romance novels. And, and he riding under this, this oak tree, and his hair gets tangled in the oak tree, and the scriptures say that he is caught there hanging between heaven and earth. And then Joab comes and throws three spears through his heart. And when David finds out, he weeps for his son Absalom. He weeps, Absalom, Absalom, you were my little boy. And I think we have got to learn to weep like David for the Absaloms, for those who, who have so much promise, but then go and get themselves tangled up in the stuff of the world, who, who get tangled up in situations that maybe they shouldn't be in, but, but just happens, and brokenness and woundedness. Can we weep like David and just meet people where they're at? How important is that? I, pastor and author Greg Boyd teaches, tells a story of um, a, a young woman who gets pregnant before she's married, and, and she was raised in a, a very strict Christian family and was afraid to tell her parents and afraid to kind of throw her life off of track and um, afraid for her dreams of going to college and whatever else. And a friend of the family, someone she trusts, she confides in this other woman before she even had told her parents. And this friend said, listen, um, if you want to carry this child to term, because the girl had been considering abortion, if you want to carry this child to term, I will support you through thick and thin. I'll be there with you and do whatever I can to help you. You can even live at my house if you have to. And her parents even ended up kicking her out of the house, and she did end up living at this friend's house. But because she had her friend there supporting her, she was able to, to carry the child to term. And then together, they, they raised this little girl, even though the lady that took her in had to take a second mortgage out on her house. Uh, and you know, this lady had convictions about what's right and wrong, about abortion and, and about right doctrine. But she knew that if it was going to make any difference in the life of this girl, she had to meet her where she was at and bleed with her, like Jesus has bled for us. And there she was, um, taking this young woman into her house and bringing her into her care uh, and, and showing her that, that, the, that, that she would meet her wherever she was. And you know, it's this moment, this powerful moment that you really see in miniature here in Paul's a letter to the Thessalonians is in chapter 2, the passage that we're looking at. It's this moment where we meet people where they're at, and, and we, we then love them into the kingdom. And I think of Jesus himself in John chapter 12. It's this Jesus moment, right? Where in John chapter 10, I'm sorry, uh, Jesus meets the, the woman who is caught in, idol, in <laughs> adultery, and, and the, the guys are surrounding her with the stones, and Jesus kneels down, you know this story, and he's drawn in the dust, right, whatever that was, and, and he says, you who have not sinned, cast the first stone, and you hear the stones dropping as they all wander away, and then he turns to this woman and says, and you, what about you? Uh, who condemns you now? Go and sin no more. He meets her where she's at and all the brokenness and the stuff in her life, and then he loves her into the kingdom. He's going sin no more. And you see that here in Paul's letter into the Thessalonians. I mean, he starts off talking there in verse 7, and he says, we were gentle among you, right? Like a mother 
caring for her little children. So Paul, he's a guy, and he says, that's like a mother with you. Um, and the word there for mother in Greek, the word is actually like a nursing mother or a wet nurse. Um, so he, he fed them um, like, like a, a mother will nurse her child. He fed them, um, and he already, we already know he, he fed them not only with his word, but also, he, as he says here, with, I was delighted to share with you not only the gospel, my, my whole life, our whole lives we shared with you. Um, and he fed them and met them where they are. And he says to the Thessalonians, listen, you, you people didn't know anything about God. You were worshiping all kinds of pagan gods. You were wrapped up in lots of different stuff that wasn't good for you. But that's where I met you, like a mother. And I, and I nurtured you. And I don't think he's saying that this is an exclusive role of mothers. Fathers nurture too. Um, and the next part is our, where he talks about fathers. Mothers do the comforting and encouraging and urging too. He's not saying that. But he's saying, I played this full role, this parental role um, I met you, and, and I just was with you in the midst of everything, um, and loving you where you're at. But then I was calling you on, that go and sin no more. Go and live a different way. Because he says here in this passage, he says uh, a little bit farther down, verse 11, for you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, right? And he says three things, encouraging, comforting, and urging you right? Encouraging, comforting, urging you to live a life worthy of God who's called you into his kingdom and glory. And, and you know, this is that moment where he meets them where they're at, but then he, then he loves them into the kingdom, right? He points them down the road because we always want to remember that this life following Jesus, first off, it's a life of growth. Um, it's a life that, that is going to be taking us somewhere. We ought to grow up and um, and, you know, nobody ever criticizes an infant for drinking milk. It's only, but, but, they, but you don't want to stay just drinking that milk. You want to be growing and move on to the solid food. And, and sometimes we, we want our kids to, to stay babies. Sometimes we want them to grow up, you know, come on, grow up. But, uh, but Paul, Paul meets them where they're at, and then he, he, he loves them into the kingdom. And it's this, this parental role that he talks about. We've got to remember that the life following Jesus is a life of growth. Uh, and we've got to also remember that the kingdom of God, and he says there that they're, they're growing towards the kingdom and glory of God. They're to be living lives worthy of that kingdom. The kingdom of God is not a utopian ideal. The kingdom of God is very concrete, people. Um, it is, is this life that is lived with God and God's priorities and purposes at our center. And so it's what Jesus prayed in the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, right? It's when we live for God's purposes and God's priorities that we are living into the kingdom. And that's really what Paul points the Thessalonians to, right? He says that I met you where you're at and then I pointed you on. And I encouraged you, I comforted you, I urged you to live that life that is worthy of the kingdoms. He's loving them into the kingdom. Well, how do we do that? Um, you know, I'm, I'm convinced that, that uh, it is not possible to annoy people into the kingdom um, or irritate people into the kingdom. I'm convinced that it calls for us to, to love them and that what people are going to remember about us um, is not going to be the ways that we just kind of hit them up with the, the, the gospel and took off, but the ways that we were with them through thick and thin. And you know, one of the things I admire about Paul is that sometimes he will just tell it straight to his churches, but there is nothing that will break, or almost nothing that will break that bond that he has with them, that deep bond of love, that commitment to the church. So how do we love people into the kingdom? Well, you know, Paul talks about that commitment, and he talks about this encouraging, comforting, and urging, and, and the first word, encouraging. You know, have you ever been encouraged because, because I have, and I mean, who wants to be told you did a lousy job? Uh, I, I don't like that. Uh, I doubt you do. Who wants to be told that you really messed up? I mean, even sometimes when we do, we just want somebody to be with us and say, listen, we're going to work it out together, or, or here's, here's what's happening, but we'll, don't worry, we're going to think, think it through. We want to be encouraged. And so think about your, your, our life together and how people have come, new people, and, and think about if, if you've encouraged them or, or maybe if you haven't. And think about how you can encourage other people in the church. Um, and, and Paul says that he comforted them. You know, when we're in a moment of brokenness that we, we speak the word of the peace of Christ into people's lives. And, 
Paul says that he was urging them, you know, which is maybe sometimes just telling it up straight. Like, here's what you need to do. Here's what I see. Here's what I hear God calling you to. Um, also just urging people to, to respond to the word of Scripture. Um, but all of this is, is this love, like a father um, who is loving them into the kingdom. How do, how do we do that among ourselves But we love, I mean, I think the basic idea is that we love them into the kingdom by showing them the love of the kingdom. Just being the love of Christ with people. Pray for others and visit others and and call them and, and take them a plate of cookies when they're sick or whatever. And, you know, those things are going to be what hold us together, those acts of love. It is not going to be our doctrinal purity when it comes down to it. That is not what we're going to remember. We are going to remember how we cared for one another. And one of the things, one of the disciplines of the church is to go to the people that are unlike you and to love them into the kingdom, to to share your life with them, to meet them where they're at and and walk with them from where they're at. Um, That means the people that annoy you. Um, That means the people that do not agree with you politically or philosophically or religiously or whatever, people that live a different way of life, those are the ones that we are to be connecting with. They are to be our companions, those who share bread together in the kingdom. I was recently uh, reading something through Mennonite Mission Network, and it talked about Irene Weaver, who was a lady who passed away here in December in Heston. And she and her husband had served... The, the church in India and in Africa and in Latin America, and if you can kind of imagine that broad service. And she said this, the older I get, the more I realize that the whole purpose of life is to love people into God's kingdom, whether you are in India, Africa, or anywhere. That's my strategy for mission. And I hear that, and I'm encouraged by that, and I'm, I'm urged on by that, that we are to love people into God's kingdom, And there are these moments in life that come when we have a chance to encourage someone, to speak a word that that lifts them up. There are these moments when we're walking with one another, when we can urge people on to grow up into the, the fullness that God's calling them to in the best sense of that word. There are these moments where we meet people in all of the brokenness of their lives and we love them into the kingdom. And folks, that is what God's calling us to. To, to, to listen to his spirit and to walk with people in that and to be there for them and to love them into the kingdom because it's all about those relationships, right? I mean, we've got this, this we just had our, our annual meeting and we've got this wonderful new constitution and team structure and committees and all of that, but none of that is the heart of what we're doing. It all is scaffolding that builds up the temple of God It is all scaffolding that that points us to these relationships with God and with one another. And we must never forget that. That's why we do things. That's what it's all about. This God who calls us, this kingdom that we serve. And I see that here. And I love that about this congregation, about this body. You care for each other. Your mothers and fathers to one another. Your sisters and brothers to one another. We're the family of God. Called, loved, and encouraged into the Father's kingdom. Thanks be to God.